Well, thank you so much, and good morning, City Center, and Happy New Year. It's great to be with you on this first Sunday of the new year and uh, to worship together. Uh, you are an amazing church. I want you to know that. Your support uh, for me personally, as I have been directing uh, Fellowship Aid and International Relief for our churches across Canada, uh, has been a blessing to me and to, to my wife, Karen. Well, it's good to reacquaint with people that haven't seen for a number of years, and uh, I know you're a little bit shocked. Some, someone said in the first service, wow, your hair got white. I said, no, it's just snow. <laughs> but where there's uh, snow on the roof, there's still fire in the, in the chimney. So uh, just let you know that today I'm still excited to share uh, the love of Christ with people today. So thank you for having me. Uh, you're a generous church. You, you've, uh, Pastor Brian has said that, and um, it's, it's an example when you care for your pastoral staff, and I commend you for that. It's, um, the reason I can say this is I've been here, and uh, so the way that you care for a, a pastor is to give him that time that he needs. And in these days of sabbatical for Pastor Derek, um, this is so good, so needed, so helpful. And uh, trust it'll be a great blessing to he and April in, in these days. Well, my purpose this morning is to um, uh, bring us uh, to... Uh, understand a new initiative that our fellowship has been doing. It's called Together for Freedom. Uh, it's a special appeal to our some 500 churches across Canada to raise funds uh, for a particular project. And the next slide shows us a quote from Gary Haugen, the CEO of IJM. He said, the poor don't have much by way of money or possessions to steal. So it seems the, the most profitable thing to steal is the whole person. It's not a nice topic to talk about today, but we're going to talk about modern day slavery. We're going to look into God's word together and see what Jesus had to say about that. But for our purposes this morning, um, the next slide tells you the two organizations that we have linked arms with. Uh, Bridge North is a national organization located here in Canada. It's a survivor-led, survivor-founded uh, ministry to women in the sex trade. Cassandra Diamond is a survivor. She's a wonderful Christian, and I would commend her to you to have her share her story here at the church. International Justice Mission, if you're not aware, has their new office here in Mississauga. And uh, it's a great organization that loves Christ, that, um, that serves the cause of Christ around the world. And today I'm gonna focus on a need in the Philippines. So there's a little video that will introduce this um, Together for Freedom campaign. Um, I'll let it play right now. What do you think of when you hear the word slavery? The British Empire abolished the slave trade in 1807, but slavery, especially in the form of sexual exploitation, is just as present today. In fact, today's technology makes sexual exploitation even easier. Just as there are many names for modern day slavery, it looks different in various parts of the world. In the Philippines, children are sold or tricked into online sexual exploitation, Victims are forced to create pornography sold to people in Canada, the United States, and Europe. In Canada, vulnerable women and children become trapped in a life of sexual exploitation. Whether it's within Canada's borders or across the world in the Philippines, the victims are separated from community and support systems to prevent rescue. All so that the slave owner can make money from their victim's suffering for as long as possible. Jesus said, The Spirit of the Lord is on me, because he has anointed me to proclaim good news to the poor. 
He has sent me to proclaim freedom for the prisoners and recovery of sight for the blind, to set the oppressed free. Just as Jesus came to bring freedom from the sin that chains us, we are called to bring justice for the captive and set them free. FAIR's partner organizations, International Justice Mission and Bridge North are already doing this work, but they need your help. Through FAIR's Together for Freedom special appeal, we're asking you to participate in four ways to bring freedom to those in today's slave trade in the Philippines and in Canada. Visit our website to find ways to learn more about modern day slavery. Pray that God would bring freedom to the sexually exploited all over the world. Download the Prayer Partners Prayer Guide for more prompts throughout the months of January to April. Fair is seeking to raise $150,000 through the Together for Freedom appeal. Funds raised will help support the vital work of IJM and Bridge North. Half will go to the rescue and rehabilitation of children trapped in online sexual exploitation in the Philippines through IJM. The other half will help advocate for women trapped in sexual exploitation in Canada and rehabilitate those seeking to escape and start a new life through Bridge North. Contact FAIR to find out how you and your church can get involved in advocating for these very real issues within your community and to help bring an end to human trafficking. Would you join with us today to support the end of slavery, to stand together for freedom? You might like to find your place in Luke chapter 4, and as you do, I think that's a good goal for us to have to uh, be involved in in this new year. It's something that Jesus calls us to. The goal of our campaign is uh, $150,000 to help these two organizations equally. Uh, to date, we've raised uh, uh, close to $100,000, so we have a ways to go and would appreciate it if God would nudge your heart in this way. In Luke chapter 4, Jesus is announcing publicly the reason for his ministry. It's always uh, grabbing the microphone, so to speak, and saying, this is who I am, and this is what I'm about. And uh, the good news that he's proclaiming is really from an Old Testament promise which he's quoting from in Isaiah chapter 61. It includes this, freedom for prisoners, sight for the blind, and liberty for those who are oppressed. The problem is that in our society and world today is that poverty is leaving billions of people without the basic protection of the law. I need you to think about that for a moment. Because when we live in a, say, fairly safe um, city and society, you can imagine what it'd be like not to have protections, not to have laws, not to have things that would safeguard you. How this looks in some ways would be for a young single mother who is uh, trying to pay her rent and a landlord comes and says, if you provide some sexual favors, your rent will be covered. Do you understand how uh, abuse and violence seeps into systems and it, it, it trickles down and very soon society gets to a very low level. That's the problem in many parts of the world today. I don't know if you have it, but I certainly have what I call a little fairness meter, justice meter inside of me. It kind of shows up when I go to a grocery store and you know, you, you're picking up some things, it's not enough for a full cartload, but it's enough that you can get your arms around and you make your way to that one to eight or one to 16 line and just as you're about to, someone's in front of you with about 25 items. And you go, that's not fair. 
But more often than not, because I drive a lot, it happens when you're driving along and the road sign says construction ahead, merge to one lane, and everyone politely moves to the, to the right lane, and then just as I get to the merge, a shiny new car butts in front of me, and I go, come on, that's not fair. But when the Bible talks about fairness or injustice, this isn't really the kind of thing that God's thinking about. You see, when the Bible talks about injustice, it's referencing a very specific kind of sin. Injustice is the abuse of power. When someone in the world, more powerful, takes, of, uh, takes from others the good things that God intends for them. Could be their dignity. Could be their liberty. Or even their life. I read about this in the book of Ecclesiastes chapter 4 and verse 1. Where the writer said, again I looked and saw all the oppression that was taking place under the sun. I saw the tears of the oppressed, and they have no comforter. Power was on the side of their oppressors, and they have no comforter. You see, that's a true picture of injustice. This is the picture of someone who has power oppressing someone who does not have it. Picture of someone who has taking from another who has not. It's really borne out, if you recall, from the story of King David. You know, the poet king of Israel, one day out on his rooftop, and a few rooftops over, he sees a young woman, and he says, I want her. And so the plan springs into motion, and he takes her for his wife, and he abuses his authority in doing so, and he tries to cover up his abuse by getting rid of her husband. Actually has him murdered in war. And so when the prophet Nathan confronts David in 2 Samuel chapter 12, it's interesting to note that he confronts King David primarily on his abuse of power. Now, we could say that these are ancient texts. We could say that these are stories from, you know, years ago. And we might like to imagine that our world has progressed and we're much more modern and it's not as abusive today and, and things are much better. But my connection with the two organizations that I've mentioned helped me to understand that it's simply not true. There are currently, as has been mentioned, over 40 million people involved in modern-day slavery. That's more than there's ever been at any point in history. That's close to the population of Canada. You might say, well, how is this possible? A number so big. How could that be that we don't know about it or, or don't comprehend it? I mean, we grow up learning about the abolition of slavery. We, we kind of like, hey, that's a good thing, and that happened, but... No, it's still happening. I can assure you that it still exists. And although it might not be part of your world or my world, for those who are caught in it, it's unimaginably awful. It's horrific. It's, it's really the story of Cassie. My wife and I were asked to travel to the Philippines, to Cebu City, uh, in 2016 to observe the work that the, the uh, organization IJM was doing there, rescuing young children from what was called online sexual exploitation. We came to, basically we had emotional roller coaster that took place. Because at one point I said to my wife as we got back to our hotel one, one evening, I said, what did we get ourselves into? This is ugly. This is, I, I, I didn't really know that we were gonna be, you know, seeing all this horrific stuff, learning about it. But that wasn't the end of the picture. We traveled to safe houses where children 
that were taken from this terrible abuse were placed into safe homes where the gospel of Jesus Christ was given to them. You know, see, I didn't know what to expect when we visited. We saw young, happy girls. They had written out Bible verses. They were all over their rooms. It was the hope of freedom in Christ that kept them going. So let me tell you the story of Cassie. She was 12 years old when she followed a a family friend who promised her, if you'll come with me to to, uh, Manila, you'll have the newest iPhone. You'll have a great education. I'll buy you the best clothes. And so she was lured into that and learned later that the man that she had trusted was running a global cyber sex ring out of his house. And for nearly five years, she was trapped with uh, other young women and children, including a two-year-old, that were um, abused. And so the, the story that I want to tell you this morning doesn't end there. It's a story of hope because Cassie was rescued. God cares for little girls like this. God cares for young children like this. And so fueled by God's heart for justice, IJM workers and authorities from U.S. Homeland Security rescued Cassie and six other children. And the man who profited from her abuse was arrested and imprisoned in his standing trial. I could tell you story after story. I could tell you Sam's story. Uh, The man that she thought cared about her was even her boyfriend. Was really just luring into the sex trade. Sam is a young woman in Canada. Her teacher began to notice telltale signs. She was missing school. She had all the newest gadgets and clothing and purses. Like, I mean like big name stuff. Like how how does a girl going to school have all of this nice stuff? And so thinking that she might be at risk for sexual exploitation, she referred Sam to Bridge North's prevention program. And she began through this program to trust the staff. Sam felt safe enough to reveal that she was being exploited. I could go on and on with these stories. But the point this morning is, what do we do with stories like this? Is it just we feel bad, we hang our head? How do we respond to what we've heard? The very best place to start would be in Luke chapter 4. So you've opened your Bible and you said, man, Pastor Dan, when are you going to get to this? Let me read from verse 16 down to verse 20. Jesus transitions here from his private life to his public ministry, and he says, it says, he went to Nazareth where he was brought up, and on the Sabbath day he went into the synagogue, as was his custom. He stood up to read, and the scroll of the prophet Isaiah was handed to him. Unrolling it, he found the place where it was written, The Spirit of the Lord is on me, because he has anointed me to proclaim good news to the poor. He has sent me to proclaim freedom for the prisoners, and recovery of sight for the blind, to set the oppressed free, to proclaim the year of the Lord's favor. Then he rolled up the scroll, gave it back to the attendant, and sat down. And the eyes of everyone in the synagogue were fastened on him. Jesus, being full of the Holy Spirit, was announcing, this is who I am. This is what I'm about. And he invites us today into this same ministry. I just love the words of verse 17. This is no accident where he found the place. He said, front and center about me and about my ministry is this. It's to bring good news to the poor. 
It's to proclaim release to the captive, recovery of sight to the blind, and the setting free of those who are oppressed. Now, <clears throat> don't get me wrong. There's a way of reading this that spiritualizes the text to say Jesus is all about giving us spiritual freedom. Yes, he is. He frees us from the captivity of our sins. Do you agree? I'm thankful for that. But that's not all that this is talking about. Jesus will never ignore a physical situation. And quoting from Isaiah 61, a very literal call to set captives free, he's offering freedom to those who are held captive. And so that's why I'm bringing to you and encouraging you to step into the mission that Jesus is calling us to today which is to partner together with these organizations so that we can see an end to human trafficking. We can see a drop in the slavery count today. I think what I'm going to do now is have a little video play. You see, when my wife and I were in the Philippines, we had something very dramatic happen while we were there there was a rescue operation in which children were released from those that were abusing them. And we were informed of it. We were able to share in it and praise God together and pray about it all. Uh, this video, although not, not that exact situation, will give you an idea of what happens. Um, and so let's play it. It'll explain itself. You understand like when I watch that I just like I want to jump up and down my body won't let me but I want to jump up and down it's the gospel of Jesus Christ folks do you understand how how insane it would be for people to go into where they're being held captive and say Jesus will release you from the captivity of your sins it falls short of course he releases us from the captivity of our sins. But do you see in this situation how exciting when they're actually released and freed by those who love the Lord? That's what we're invited to. And so this morning, this story of rescue can seem maybe just like a drop in the ocean because the 40 million number is so large. But I assure you, when we're involved with these two organizations, we're, they're experiencing miraculous transformation around the world. 
in Cebu City where we visited in the Philippines, a project was initiated to combat sex trafficking and after five years, they witnessed a 79% reduction in the number of minors that were being sold for sex. That's a massive decrease. The Filipino government then decided to scale this strategy to other metropolitan areas. And by the grace of God, in just the span of a decade or two, we're seeing such eradication of sex trafficking of minors in the Philippines. But that's not the only spot. It's happening all over the world. And we can't be asleep to this problem. Jesus is calling to us today to be involved in this and to see an end to this. And so let this miraculous truth sink in as we move closer to seeing the end of slavery in our lifetime. This is the mission of Jesus, what happens when the church stands up and takes a stand and does something. It's really the issue that Jesus is calling us to in Luke chapter 4 to go after the lost sheep, to care for the wounded lambs, the sparrows, and those that have been kicked to the curb, so to speak, and forgotten and abandoned. So as we wrap up this morning, I want you to realize what can we actually do? What can we really do about this situation? I mean, what can City Center do? If you're like me, you all of a sudden sort of clamp up and freeze. 40 million. We can't do anything about that. That's so huge. Kind of reminds us of that Sunday school story of the feeding of the 5,000. Jesus was teaching all day long to crowds of people, telling them the good news. And the disciples, they say, uh, Jesus... Send them home. We don't have food. Send them home so they can eat. And Jesus, wanting to teach them, says, hey, listen, why don't you feed them? What? With what? We don't have enough money. There's no Costco nearby. What are we going to do? So Jesus asked two questions that we need to ask ourselves this morning. What do you have, and will you give it to me? That's what he asked of the little boy. What do you have, will you give it to me? Jesus will take responsibility for the miracle as long as we're obedient and hand it over to him. And so I really want to give you a specific invitation this morning. Would you offer your packed up lunch to him? Would you get involved to learn more about this problem in our world? Would you pray? Would you give? Would you have the heart of Jesus impressed upon you more and more this year? This morning, I invite you to consider what you can do. And as I finish, I, I want to end with this thought. I suppose it's a comfort and a challenge. It's this. We can't do everything, but we must not do nothing. Doing nothing is one option that we don't have. Doing nothing denies the heart of our Lord and our mission as the people of God. And so my prayer this morning, if you'll join with me, in a world that's desperate to know the goodness of our God, that we offer our lives to Jesus, the little lunches that he's given to us, in order to set captives free. Will you join me in prayer? God, thank you for the glorious gospel that a Jesus announced. Thank you, Jesus, that you're all about announcing freedom. And from our hearts we say, thank you, Lord, for saving us, for release from our sin that has held us captive. But Lord, we're learning of little ones, little sparrows that are being held, not of any wrongdoing of their own. 
And Lord, we pray for their freedom. And Lord, the little that we could do, the little that we could give, the prayers that we make even from this day forward will all attribute to help in seeing them released. Lord, we want to join our heart with yours. And so make it so this day, we pray in Christ's name. Amen.